What's up, people? My name is Shaggy, the Opinionated Hippie. Um, finishing up my reviews of the Deep Purple albums and my rankings of them. Uh, we have four albums left, the ones I consider S-tier albums. Um, and yeah, that's about it. So I did videos. There was one C-tier, a bunch of B-tiers, a bunch of A-tiers, and now we have four S-tiers left. Um, uh, just to address the fact that I am making videos uh, much more fr frequently uh, the normal for two reasons. One, it is now summer. School's out for summer. Um, that's a rabbit hole I'm definitely going down one day. And um, uh, secondly, I caught COVID. I'm not sick in any way, shape, or form, um, but I am now isolated in essentially two rooms in our house. So I get to live in two rooms for like the next uh, three or four more days. But yeah, so it kind of sucks. But anyways, hence the frequency of videos. But that's all I got to say. I uh, just wanted to get that out there. And now on to the four, my top four favorite Deep Purple albums. Number four, Come Taste the Band. This is the only album by the Mark IV lineup, the lineup that only had two original members in it, Lord and pace and then no other members that had been in the band um instead you had coverdale and hughes coverdale is lead singer hughes is lead singer and bass player they had been there for two albums this was their third um and then you had um now blackmore had left and this is tommy boland's only album this is a fantastic album and before i get into just the fun of the album and the incredibly good energy and just the way it's presented and everything about it um I really wish this was an instance in which like Lord and Pace had decided not to use the band name Deep Purple and had instead birthed it a whole new band. Maybe they call it White Snake. Who knows? Um, that had not existed yet. Um, keeping with the color theme, purple and white, um, Covered Ale would still be in it. Um, because from what I read is, yes, Tommy Bolin had drug issues and yes, Tommy Bolin uh, was h highly inconsistent on whether he showed up, like, not literally, I guess maybe literally sometimes, but whether he showed up to play competently um, throughout the tour. But apparently he got a lot of sort of fan abuse for not being Blackmore, um, which, you know, that, that sucks. Um, I mean, it's okay to have that opinion. You don't need to make him feel bad about not being Blackmore. But apparently that was hard on him. But for whatever the reason, had it not been Deep Purple, maybe this band, maybe this album would have been received with much more love. Because Boland, while nowhere near, maybe not nowhere near, but definitely not the technical mastery of the guitar that both Blackmore and Morse has, is a really tasty, come taste the band, tasty guitar player. Like, one, they give him a lot of room on this album. There's like minute plus outro solos. Um, a lot of these tracks end with fade outs and it's not like a, a repeated chorus fade out, but like the band is jamming and having an amazing time fade out. And you're like, no man, just let this play out. Let's, I wanna know where this went. Like the energy on this album is fantastic. Um, it, I would say it's, it's maybe light hard rock. It's definitely rock. It's got a, a kind of a hard edge. Um, side B especially has some really good riffs in it. Um, but like, a, there's a lot of piano by Lords. You get like a more rock and roll, true rock and roll feel. Um, the melodies are a little like sweeter than, you know, and maybe a normal, the last couple albums. Um, there's some really great funk thrown in. That's phenomenal. Um, on the third track, especially, um, there's just so many great things about this album. Um, it's nine songs, 10 songs technically. One of them is this, uh, the second to last track is two songs that have just been like a really ballady, reminds me of, it's a Glenn Hughes singing a ballad, kind of reminds me of George Michael's father figure, um, or even Simon Le Bon on uh, Duran Duran's Save a Prayer. There's a really that emotional 80s vibe that I think works phenomenally. And then it goes into this instrumental that is just ridiculous. It has this great riff, some great solos. It just closes out. It has such a kind of a weirdly dark, melancholy tone about it. It's just phenomenal, like one of the highlights in their catalog. Um, uh, but that could be two tracks. 
that could be Index as two tracks, but it's one. So there's kind of like 10 songs on here. Um, so you get Coming Home, a great opener. One of the best things about the opener is it starts off with like that Blue Oyster Cult, uh, the red and the black, that not as extreme as the red and the black, but just like this announcing like, we're here. And then they go in just to this fun rocker. Um, the third song, Getting Tighter, has this incredible funk jab in the middle of it. Um, Dealer um, closes out with a really, really nice bowling solo at the end. Um, the Drifter on side B is the first one that has any real good riffs. The riffs start to kick in hard on side B. You get the Drifter with the great riff. You get Love Child with the great riff. You get the great riff in O to G, the second part of that twofer. Um, what else? I'll try to take notes on this. Um, there is just... There is just so much good stuff on here. Um, the bass playing on the final track, the final track is kind of a slower, more drawn out spacey number and the bass kind of drives that. That's a really tasty way to close the album. And that ends not on a fade out, but on like a duh, like we're done and we have something to say. Oh, that was the other thing on the opening track. My only complaint is the opening track also ends on a fade out. But because they come in so hard with that, duh, I almost wish they ended it with like a, duh, like a, we, we are here, a definitive like foot stomp, but they don't. A very, very minor little thing. Um, some, the song I Need Love kind of has a early Rod Stewart vibe, um, like can't, every picture tells a story type era, um, the way the vocals are delivered. Um, and then that also has a, a really nice, uh, uh, funky kind of thing that like starts off with this more traditional Rod Stewart like R&B type thing and then goes into some heavy funk before it fades out but yeah just a ridiculously good album man and I, I do think it would be would have been appreciated sooner had it been under the name of a different band because being a Deep Purple album it's going to be compared to other Deep Purple albums and I don't necessarily think it's a good Deep Purple album but it is a great rock album um if that makes any sense but my number four come taste the band number three fireball this came out in 1971 it's the second album of the mark ii lineup the classic lineup that is also responsible for the last two albums on this list that would be ian gillen on vocals uh, Roger Glover on bass, Ian Pace on drums, John Lord on keyboards, and Richie Blackmore on guitar. This is, again, just a perfect album, and it is so perfectly well-balanced, and it prevents all the different flavors of Deep Purple. Um, it, I mean, there's just nothing wrong with it. Opens up with a literal barn burner, Fireball. Get a fireball anywhere near a barn and it will burn um, just straight out the gates. We get a little, like, weird effect action as if we're, like, and I think they do this again on uh, on the next album, Machine Head, like a little effect. In the, they don't have the effect on the next one, but they simulate like the starting of some kind of engine and like we're about to like take off. In this case, it might be a spaceship since we're a fireball, but it's just like this weird like shh, like igniting an ignition and then we're just off with fireball. It's ridiculous. Um, and then the next song, No, 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 all of a sudden Richie Blackmore is just playing the funkiest li lick you've ever heard him play on the guitar. I mean, it's just ridiculous stuff. Strange Kind of Woman, I always think is like, I don't know exactly who wrote it. I've always assumed Ian Gillen is responsible mostly for this song because it just seems to capture whatever he is bringing personality-wise, the sort of quirky lyrics, the great storytelling, the sort of character create these characters that he creates throughout all these songs throughout the years this to me is like strange kind of woman is like just the perfect example of all those things blackmore is used perfectly live this was just such an amazing song the way they would kind of bring it down and like joke around for a while uh love this song um then they have a little bit of fun with uh anyone's daughter kind of a back porch folk kind of jam again these are also some weird quirky gillen lyrics um uh, there's a farmer's daughter, there's a sheriff's daughter, and then anyone's daughter. It's just this fun little quirky little folky number. Um, the mule, if they get psychedelic in the mule, pace takes over on drums. We definitely have a very strange Tomorrow Never Knows esque hard rock, like kind of a hard rock version of Tomorrow Never Knows. Just that weird psych drum sound, and the band just delivers over that. Um, Fools, they kind of slow things down for a while. It's got like a nice mellower, but kind of still, even though it's not, doesn't feel like it's really going anywhere, there is still an intensity to it. 
and then that drops into some crazy riff and then they go into this long extended section in the middle where like again they just go into like this like really almost spacey psych space then they drop back and back into the riff and then they kind of just flirt with that soft space again as the song ends and then the album closes out with one of their best songs ever no one came just a great just a great rocker from start to finish some great lyrics about the early days of deep purple just nothing wrong with this album the playing the lyrics the singing the drumming the bass playing the guitar solos lord everything about this album is like darn near perfect number three fireball number two deep purple in rock this came out in 1970 this is the first release of the mark ii lineup another perfect album like really you can't go wrong with any of the tracks on this album um starts off as almost all deep purple albums start off with like the with just a straight ahead like racehorse full attack mode song speed king the title says it all even though like you know classic deep purple fashion they kind of mess with the middle section and it gets a little like psych keyboardy and kind of like a little more Definitely not as hard rock in the middle, you know, but again, that's, that's their, that is their calling card from this point on is like to de defy expectations in those middle grooves. So Bloodsucker, which has this incredibly awesome riff that they just keep repeating over and over and over. And the, the entire solo section is like this riff, a little bit of a solo. And you think the solo is going somewhere and they drop back into this riff. The entire band does. It, it makes for this really quirky fragmented just hard rock monster um child in time um apparently the the lyrics are anti or about the cold war or commentary on the cold war i guess that's true i mean if he if ian gillen says that's why he wrote it that's why he wrote it but either way it's not the most optimistic song but man is it powerful um it's one of those quiet loud quiet loud songs the be the first you know third maybe 25 percent third is like uh some just some really tasty organ work by Lord, some absolutely amazing vocals by Gillen. Then they go into this overdrive jam where Blackmore is just literally trying to play as fast as he can. Um, then they go drop out of that and go right back into the organ. And then they kind of build it back up again at the end. Just a master class in like contrast and relief and like, oh, it's it's a ridiculous song. Um and then the next side, uh, that's that's the end of side A. Side B, Flight of the Rat. Super, super funky song. It's got a super funky middle. Um, and it's funny, the, the jam in the middle gets so intense. Like, instead of, like, actually segueing back into the main riff, they, like, stop cold and then go back into the main riff. It almost seems like we just, there's no other way to get out of this. This is funking so hard. Um, so that's cool. I even think there's a little drum solo at the end of it. So um, Into the Fire, the verses in Into the Fire have some of the hunkiest riffs ever. Um, hard rock funk, going back to some hardcore hunk in Into the Fire. Living Wreck, um, we got some really good vocals by Gillen. Um, again, gets funky in the middle. Um, and then the album closes out with Hard Loving Man, which has this sort of galloping energy that is just kind of steadily like just galloping, hard rock gallop towards towards the finish with solos and just yeah what a phenomenal phenomenal album like almost perfect so yeah number two deep purple and rock and number one highway star the third album of the mark ii lineup this was released in 1972 um and it is just not only is it probably one of the best hard rock albums of all time but it is like a fun hard rock album like i think that is like this captures everything perfect about this band is uh came out right after my sister was actually born um um is not only does this band rock harder than other bands but it's a fun band and it's just like i think this album has so much incredible positive energy it's funky the songs are like all over the map but in the best way possible um seven songs opens up with Highway Star, and as I was talking about on um, for Fireball, the whole intro to this, the just like slowly building up until we just drop into the vocals, sounds like you're starting a car, and then you're letting the car warm up, and then you're revving the car, and then you're just like off, like you just take off. Like the music completely simulates 
that, and the lyrics are, of course, about that. I mean, it is just such a perfect, just so perfectly well done. And then you have those solos in the middle. You know, you have that long written section with uh, Blackmore at the end of his part. I mean, just ridiculous song before they go back into the final uh, verse. Um, maybe I'm a Leo. I've always thought that Josh Homme of Queens of the Stone Age fame loved this album when he was a kid and decided he was going to base his entire career on Maybe I'm a Leo and variations on that. And that is a good thing because I think this is just another great hard rock hunky groove. Pictures of Home, um, again, more of a really good, almost a proggy, melodic type hard rock song. Um, um, a bass solo gets thrown in there towards the end, um, but it has some really neat, um, I don't know, it seems not as f hard rock, not as like hunky as the one that would follow it and never before. Um, um, but I don't know, there's something really just, I guess it's a little more proggy than the other stuff. Um, never before, again, some great funk on here. It's got a chorus that I think would have made it more popular on like FM radio in the 70s had it got played, but that sounds almost like a hit song. Never before. Just sounds like a not Deep Purple song, but they do it so effortlessly that it works. Um, and then side B, I mean, it's just perfect. Uh, Smoke on the Water is the opener. Um, again, another example, kind of like Woman from Tokyo, where like Blackmore plays the riff, then Pace comes in, um, and then I think uh, Glover comes in, you know, and finally they drop into the whole song with Lord and the vocals joining in, and the way they just slowly build up that energy, and then, man, what a ridiculous song. Lazy. Lord gets a chance to shine. Blackmore comes in with that ridiculous riff. They kind of play around with solos and they mess around with that riff for a while. We finally get some vocals, another some more jamming at the end. Another perfect song. And then Space Trucking, which is just high energy, pedal to the metal fun to close out the album. Yeah, a perfect hard rock album. A perfect rocked al album. A perfect Deep Purple album. Like, it is just... Little flavors of funk, little flavors of prog, maybe some more mainstream rock in there. The entire career of Josh Homme laid out before us. Yeah, man, the best hard rock riff ever, if not arguably the best hard rock song ever on this album. Um, yeah, man, it's a perfect album, man. If you only get one Deep Purple album, I personally would say that it is this one. But yeah, my number one Deep Purple machine head. And that is it for my Deep Purple albums. At some point in the future, I will address the live albums, but there are a couple I'm not that familiar with, so I'm going to have to get familiar with them. There's a lot of those, more live albums than studio albums, so I'm not even sure how to narrow that field down if I have to. But anyways, uh, I'm going to do a songs video and then uh, move on to something else. Um, I was going to be addressing the Zappa release, which was supposed to come out on June 3rd, the Zappa Eerie, uh, this three shows. Uh, from near Erie, Pennsylvania, but that release date was pushed back to the 17th. So if that sticks, I'll have information on that probably around the 24th. Might give myself a week, maybe a little more since it is a lot of shows, but it's summer, so I have more time and hopefully I won't have COVID then. Anyways, thanks for watching. Subscribe, like, all that stuff, comment. Let me know your thoughts on these albums, what I messed up on, what I'm wrong about, why my opinion sucks, man, um, and all that stuff. You know how it works. Peace. Take care, be safe.